More people die every year from waterborne illnesses than are killed in conflict. The amount of wastewater produced annually is six times more than the water in all the rivers of the world. Around one billion people do not have steady access to safe water. We literally are living in our own wastewater. The child dies every 20 seconds from diarrhea from unsafe water. In the next 10 years, 15 years, or indeed in our lifetimes, water will run out for us in some parts of the world. Water is much more precious than gold. Clean, safe, and adequate fresh water is vital to the survival of all living organisms and the functioning of ecosystems, communities, and economies. But the United Nations is warning that the quality of the world's water is increasingly threatened as human populations grow, industrial and agricultural activities expand, and as climate change accelerates. UN Water, a body that brings together 27 United Nations agencies and programs that deal with different aspects of water, says there is an urgent need for the global community to take on the challenge of protecting and improving the quality of our water sources. 22nd March 2010 marked World Water Day. The main worldwide event was held at the UNEP UN Habitat headquarters in Nairobi, Kenya. It was a collaboration between the two agencies. The connection also between the environment and the sustainability agenda that UNEP in a sense is tasked with and the role of UN Habitat to look particularly at the evolution of urban centers of how urbanization will affect the quality of life of people I think makes us natural partners and UN Water gave us an opportunity to jointly demonstrate how that partnership can work in practice, how our mandates correlate and in water really come together to address an issue from literally where the water comes from, how it is used and where it goes to. I wish to applaud the collaboration between UN Habitat and UNEP in putting together this important event. Our partnership under the umbrella of UN Water Task Force on wastewater management has created synergy in tackling the ever-increasing challenges posed by water pollution. The theme of this year's event was clean water for a healthy world. The aim of the event was to raise awareness on water quality worldwide and to prompt action for improvement. The Nairobi event comprised three consecutive days of activity. It began on Saturday the 20th with a one-day workshop attended by international journalists who specialize in reporting on water and the environment. Knowing the, the problems which we all know and uh, etc. There will be a lot of focus on how we should as, a, as an environment, or as a world, uh, change our attitudes and make sure that we have clean water for our health and for our ecosystems. So I hope that those kind of messages will be, uh, will be shown uh, during those, this day and be reflected in the articles and, and documentaries and the products you're going you're gonna to make. You have on, on your desk uh, another study. The workshop was an interactive affair and after a variety of presentations by experts, the journalists broke out into groups to discuss their experiences reporting water. I based my, my story in a document, a study. Each group then reported back on the challenges and best practices they had encountered in the line of duty. There was also Obed from Kenya from our group who did a story on water crisis in Nairobi about boreholes and thanks to his story the boreholes project was stopped. The second day took the journalists on field trips to three different sites. The first was to Mombasa on the Kenyan coast where they visited a wastewater treatment project at the Shimolatewa prison. A second group of journalists flew to Kisumu, Kenya's third largest city, which lies on the shores of Lake Victoria. Here they received a briefing on water resources management and water quality issues around the lake. The third group of visiting journalists took a trip to Soweto East Village in the informal settlement of Kibera within Nairobi City. Kibera is the second largest informal settlement in Africa, 
with more than half a million people living on just 250 hectares of land. Here, UN Habitat, in conjunction with the Government of Kenya, has implemented a water and sanitation program. Apart from contributing to the achievement of the MDGs on water and sanitation, it is designed to control the discharge of effluent into River Ngong and the Nairobi Dam in order to restore their water quality. Before this block was built, we used what they call flying toilets, where we used plastic bags. Now we have a better quality of life. The Kibera slum borders the Nairobi Dam, an overgrown water reservoir which less than two decades ago was a popular recreation site and home to the Nairobi Sailing Club. Today, due to the uncontrolled discharge of effluent into the dam, it has been invaded by the rapidly spreading water hyacinth. Part of the Kibera water and sanitation activities involved the reclamation and rehabilitation of this water body. This dam will not be the same, I mean will not be rehabilitated if the problems in Kibera are not addressed. And th those are the problems of solid waste management, those are the problems of uh, removing or relocating the people who are living on the riparian zone so that we can rehabilitate the riparian zone and control the amount of uh, waste water that is going in. The journalist's next stop was the Nairobi River to view the truly inspiring results of a multi-stakeholder initiative that has seen the restoration of 2.5 kilometers of the riparian zone along the river. A reforestation program has been undertaken, transforming a once dangerous and filthy dump site into an idyllic park that acts as a lung for the city. If we can change this stretch, then we can change the entire Nairobi River system. I said it's about 70 kilometers in stretch. Now the trees you are seeing across are hardly three years old and they are small little saplings. So it means that with this stretch is a very good example that the 70 kilometers, if we can look after it, we can have it all greened up. The Nairobi River Basin Initiative collaborates closely with the University of Nairobi's School of Physical Sciences to monitor water quality in the Nairobi River. On this occasion, the university team was on hand to demonstrate the monitoring process. School children have also been involved in an international education and outreach program to build public awareness and involvement in protecting water resources. If the chart remains the way it is, that shows the water is clear, okay? And then if the color changes... The journalists' visits to the three sites proved to be an eye-opener for the participants. My field trip per se to Mombasa was, I mean, was an experience. And I think that I'm going back at somebody who is really much more fascinated and very um, impacted, you know, to be able to deepen my report and my education and stuff in reporting on water and sanitation. It was very much a two-way street with the media that enabled us to, to really boost um, their capacity to uh, deliver our messages. From what I could tell, we had probably more than a thousand stories that came out and I'm still getting people sending me clippings and from everywhere in the world. We need to have more regular interactive dialogue with the media. We need to give them the information they need to report on what we want the public to understand. That's how we change behavior because once the public understands through the media what the problems are, they're better able to influence their policy makers and decision makers. Then came the main event, World Water Day 2010. The UN Habitat UNEP headquarters at Gigiri in Nairobi played host to some auspicious guests. The dignitaries who graced the event included His Royal Highness Willem Alexander, Prince of Orange, and the former president of Mozambique, His Excellency Joachim Chisano. The concerns of future generations over the conservation of the world's most precious and diminishing resource were presented to the plenary by 13-year-old Trevor Gitonga. Children are the direct victims 
or beneficiaries of your decisions and actions. Let us work together for a common, better, and prosperous future. We are aware that water as a global agenda is emotional and sensitive, particularly in view of water scarcity in many parts of the world. This scarcity threatens global peace if it is not handled properly, and indeed it is often said that the third world war will be fought over water. During the course of the World Water Day event, numerous statistics on water quality were presented by experts, emphasizing the grave situation facing the future of our planet. But despite the alarming scenarios conjured up regarding the poor quality of water, there is some hope. Zafar Adil, chair of UN Water, launched the UN Water Statement on Water Quality, which goes beyond stating the problem and reveals some fundamental solutions to water quality problems. There are three primary uh, pathways through which we can achieve this. The first one is to prevent pollution in the first place, and as they say, prevention is better than cure. We also have to look at treating uh, polluted water and use the ample technologies which are available to us. We also have to restore and protect the ecosystems, which means that uh, we have to support restoration activities and determine and provide the, the minimum needs of uh, these ecosystems for water. His Royal Highness, the Prince of Orange, made his keynote speech in his capacity as chair of UNSGAB, the UN Secretary General's advisory board on water and sanitation. Today is about clean water for a healthy world. It is not enough to have water, it must be fit for humans to drink. UNEP's report, Sick Water, makes this stark fact alarmingly clear. Our water is killing us. We need a concerted effort to treat polluted water before returning it to the environment. But we need a 21st century model. Business as usual for wastewater collection, treatment and reuse is not the answer. With the increased global momentum towards improving access to safe water and sanitation, UNEP, UN Habitat and UNSGAB in partnership with UN Water collaborated to release a report entitled Sick Water. Thank you very much. Congratulations. What we need to do is to start to um, tailor, better tailor our publications to, to our audiences. I think the publication Sick Water that was jointly done between UNEP and UN Habitat um, very much did that. It was a good mix of, of real hard data, but turned into information that uh, was very usable by the media and very usable by the public. In addition, UN Habitat launched a solid waste management report that addresses the challenges of managing solid waste in urban areas. Solid waste, you know, is at the heart of every municipality. They are, they are in charge of getting rid of their waste in the town. So it's a very close topic towards uh, UN Habitat. And there again, uh, a lot of, uh, we have not had much attention to these two type of uh, big issues of, the, of this century. And so the publications came at the right moment and at uh, the right time. One way of increasing access to sustainable water and sanitation for the poor is through capacity building of public utilities. The Global Water Operators Partnerships Alliance was set up to address the capacity gap facing these utilities and increase their efficiency and financial viability. The Water Operators Partnerships Alliance was one of the key recommendations of the Hashimoto Action Plan. And, uh, and they, UNSGAB had a sort of internal evaluation themselves and our, our water operators was being conceived as the most successful action point of the Hashimoto Action Plan. Uh, so they, uh, they gave it to us, to Habitat, to further develop. If we want to achieve the MDGs, we need to involve the water utilities. They have been forgotten too often uh, and uh, we have to concentrate on them and we have to bring them forward into the, to the development debate. And we're very glad to see that UN Habitat has taken up uh, the, this global uh, alliance and really made it grow. Uh, and it's essential to partner uh, successful uh, uh, water operators 
uh, in the first world, but also self-self connections and private and public in all, all kinds of ways to create uh, good uh, water operators uh, in the third world that can deliver high quality uh, water to the people in, in developing countries. World Water Day 2010 was unique in several ways, including special emphasis on journalist sensitization to issues of water quality and the collaboration between UNEP and UN Habitat in organizing and hosting the event. I will be um, taking um, um, the new ideas that I have heard from this event from participants, from different stakeholders, mainly from media students, uh, and then we'll take into account these ideas in our programs and projects. Being here has been able to uh, make me appreciate the degree to which uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, work to do. And uh, as a young scientist, I've been uh, inspired to be able to take uh, an initiative to be able to see to it that we can be able to solve the problem. What was really the strength of this particular World Water Day was the very close collaboration between the two uh, UN agencies. We were able to um, bring two different perspectives together which causes both of us to broaden our minds. One of us looks at urban settlements, the other one looks at uh, environment. So it was that strength of bringing the two agencies together that I think really led to our success. I think the ultimate yardstick for a World Water Day or any day on themes that are part of the MDG uh, world that we deal with uh, in terms of the Millennium Development Goals has to be, does it empower people to believe that a better way is possible? If they take that message away from this, day's, this year's World Water Day, I think we will have done a great deal together. An opportunity for the two agencies to build on the success of this partnership will present itself next year when UN Habitat plays host to the next edition of the World Water Day.